Welcome. Today we're going to meet Brian Gerling, one of the few male authors that I know. And um, so, Brian, uh, I'm going to let you talk about why you decided to write in the first place. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. It's it's good to be here with you and, and good to see you again. Um, why do I write in the first place? That is a really good question. The My first instinct is to say, um, I feel like I've always been writing. I, I can't I can't conceive of a time when I wasn't a writer or saw myself as a writer. Even early on in elementary school, I remember getting really excited about writing uh, assignments, like more so than other kids. And there's just one memory, early memory I have of being a sixth grader. And we had to write uh, a script in a group uh, to feature um, one of the planets. And my team got Neptune. And I was like, I'm writing the script, guys. I'm going to. And I, and I like had a bunch of fun characters and comedy and it was this whole shebang. And when we got to present it to the class, I took it like really seriously because it was like situation. It was a sitcom and that type of thing. So I've just kind of always been writing and um, yeah. That's so cool. It, it feels kind of like it's just been there for me. Yeah. Yeah. And you're funny too. I, I hope mean, so. You have a great sense of humor. Oh. I mean, you have to. Being a teacher, you're almost like an entertainer. Yes. That oh, I forgot to mention, he's a teacher, too. I am a teacher. What do you teach? School. Yeah, I'm a high school English teacher. So I work, right, this year I work with ninth graders and 11th graders, so junior and, and freshman uh, English students. And um, you're so right about that. We have to entertain our students or else they fall asleep. <laughs> I've, I've found that when I have my students' attention, um, they learn better. And so doing whatever I can to hold their attention sometimes yeah. it becomes a little bit of a stand-up, uh, stand-up. I'm sure talk. you bring them into everything like immersive, like just kind of make them part of it too. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I try to mix it up. I'm always learning new things to do in the classroom and, um, I never want it to be a predictable, dull experience. And plus uh, you're, you teach, you're like a drama leader. I don't know if it's yeah. a teacher or or if that's as a class, but. Well, I was a theater teacher. That's how I kind of got into teaching. And then I shifted later on in my career um, to teach English. So, but I find that whenever I, I do plays like The Crucible um, or, or any play really in the curriculum, that's where I get to really get excited uh, because I feel like all my skills are kind of coalescing in the same space. And mm -hmm. when I read, anytime I read, I, I, I kind of bring an actor's perspective to it because of that theater background, so. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So why did you decide to write this particular book? His book, his new book that's coming out, Nellie, they changed the date a little bit. November what? 16th. 16th. Okay. And it's called The Book of Rules. The Book of Rules. Right? Yep. yep. Just. Why did you write that? <laughs> super, super intense, right? Intimidating because what kid is going to want to read a book called The Book of Rules, right? Because <laughs> it's love rules so much. Can you show us the cover? Um, yes, if I, well. Or do you want me to share a screen and just show you the picture? Show the picture yeah. that I, yeah? Yeah. Okay, hold on, I'll show, share screen. Technology things. Yes, my screen's not. Whoa. Whoops, let yeah. me minimize. Minimize, where do I? Hey, go? you have a very organized desktop and I appreciate oh, thanks. the fall, <laughs> the fall theme you've got going on. Oh, we yeah. went there. I just got back from there. I mean, oh, that's that's a that's, photo you took, or yes, we went up there for okay. my daughter and I went up for a fall tour of Where the Northeast. That? So we just got back. I want to um, be there right now. Yeah. So there's the book, the cover, guys. There's the cover, Tom Knight. That doesn't Tom look Knight. too serious. I don't think uh, kids well, are going to be. In yeah, I was being sarcastic, 100. <laughs> so Tom yeah. Knight did a phenomenal job. I've just been so. Um, honored to share this book with him what he's brought to the art and the story has been phenomenal so um why i i wrote this book i was actually um i started education as a special education paraprofessional mm -hmm. in an elementary school while i was waiting for that first theater job so i was there for a year and that's where i kind of discovered picture books uh -huh. as a genre and i was like oh my gosh i could do this i could write books like this this is so fun like I love seeing the kids come alive when they're being read to. And mm -hmm. um, some of them are just genuinely funny, even for the adults. And it was like, oh my gosh, like I, I have to try this. So 
fast forward a little bit, I became a theater teacher, but then I, I eventually stopped that and wound up in the same elementary school as a paraprof- paraprofessional with uh, the SPED department for a semester while I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. Ended up in a library uh, as a youth librarian. But anyways, um, that semester when I came back as a para, I um, that's when I was really trying to become an author for picture books. I was cranking out a lot of stories. I was actively seeking representation. And I was in this elementary school and just kind of soaking in the natural rhythm of a school, which is a constant transitions, constant uh, following of rules, um, going in between different things and, and teachers very varying success rates at, at all that. And um, I just kept hearing there was, it, that fall. Um, I don't remember when it happened, but there's this really strong voice. I kept hearing this book has rules. You must follow the rules. And it was like, oh, ooh, a meta book. I love meta fiction. It, it's just so fun. Yeah. Um, and that's often how my books come to me is just a, a line of dialogue or a narrative voice. Yeah. Um, narrator voice will come to me. So um, what the book ended up becoming was an interactive text where the, the readers have to do the rules of the book or they'll be eaten by a monster. And instead of a, a really, really scary book, um, I wanted it to be very clear that this is comedic. So I thought of the the least scary name for any monster ever, and that is Dennis. And Dennis. Delightful Dennis, <laughs> purple monster that you would let babysit your kids and be totally fine with it. He's not going to harm a fly. So it's it's totally fun and games. And I had a school setting in mind, a group read aloud experience, but it definitely still works with those bedtime moments. If you want a little bit of a different experience with reading to kids before bed. So that's kind of where it came from. And I really hope that kids and parents and teachers and librarians have fun uh, playing with the book and following along and trying not to get eaten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> so this book is uh, going to be a hardcover or soft cover yes hardcover um yeah right now it's a uh, hardcover and um I will think there be an uh, ebook or an audiobook either i don't know about audiobook i haven't heard anything about that but it's still it's currently also available as uh, an e-reader so a an electronic book is still um is still available yeah paperback that's uh jury's out on that i think that'll be I think I'm not really sure how that works. I think it's uh, sometimes they get made in paper bags, sometimes they don't. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So you have you had to find an agent, and then you had to that agent had to sell the book to a publisher. You went traditional. Yes. Yeah. So tell us about that little. How long did that take? Um. Yeah. So, and a little a little side story before I get into that story. Um, the book of rules was actually ne- I never queried it to an agent. It was something I wrote just for fun. Oh, after school, it was like, this is never going to get published. Let me just write this for fun. And it's total silly. And I think there's something interesting about a creative mindset where your only goal is to play and just express. And there's no pressure to be published or pressure to do something with it that has like, I don't know, because I think the scary pressure of you know, will this sell? Will this be marketable? Will an agent like it? Will an editor like it? You know, how is this going to work? It kind of just squelches it, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. There's something like work and not fun. Yes. Yes. So I was just sitting in the kitchen, just totally playing. And then it sat in a folder for a long time. And it was months after I got my agent that I was kind of, we were trying to figure out, okay, what, what might we go on submission next? Um, What, what are some future projects we might want to work together on and kind of see what options are out there, what I have hidden away in my folders. And I pulled this one out and was like, well, maybe. So I kind of shared it with my online critique group and they were like, this is great. This is really fun. Um, My agent liked it and it got, it went through several rounds of of critique and then it kind of took off. So it went from being a nothing just for fun story to a very serious thing. Um, Okay. So that was a side story. So how I got my agent, I, I queried, for two years straight, um, which in the grand scheme of things compared to a lot of folks, which you shouldn't compare yourself to people. That's a recipe for unhappiness. Um, everybody's right. on their own journey. But my journey, my specific journey was two years um, of aggressive querying. Um, and I, I am a person who sometimes learns the hard way, um, trial by fire. 
I've seen across my life. Um, and I ended up getting close to 600 rejections, like 594, 593, or something like that. So I round up and say 600. And that's, I mean, I have all the, all the, um, you, you have the paper to prove it. it. Yeah. I, I, I tracked it all, all the, all the rejection. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, from January, 2017, when I first started querying to January, 2019, when I signed with my agent, um, yeah, I, I had almost just about two dozen manuscripts and sent to various forms or various manuscripts of that batch of that two dozen batch to like 85. Were they all 80. picture books? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of them, I really wouldn't touch with a 39 and a half foot pole anymore. If you know what I mean? Like I really, I think some of them were, were too wet behind the ears to send out. Yeah. And so that was part of that learning process of like, I was just so enthusiastic and excited and wanted to get published. So it was kind of like, what about this? This is really fun. And I just finished this one and maybe it had a little bit of revision and maybe other humans saw it before, but sometimes it was like, I'm just going to query this and see what happens. Yeah. And I think the analogy I've been using lately is like, it, it's kind of like I grabbed a handful of darts from a bowl and threw those darts against the wall, hoping something would stick. And yeah, it's not a great method to find an agent. I think a better method, if I could give myself advice would be like, Hey, slow down, be really intentional with the manuscripts you share, give each story its due diligence in the critique and revision process. There's no rush. Don't feel like you have to, you know, rush to be published or find an agent, uh, you know, have, have a good diverse body of work. It's good that I had many stories because a lot of times when you get an agent, when you get their attention with the manuscript, they'll, the first thing they'll ask before they want to talk to you on the phone to take it serious, uh, to take it to the next step. They'll ask if you have any more, mm-hmm. you know, they'll ask you to share more, more work so they can see kind of your breadth and depth and your voice. Mm-hmm. And so it helps to have a bunch in your, in your bag, ready to go to show. So that part was good, but mm-hmm. I think that I, I just kind of went after it a little bit too aggressively. <laughs> yeah, it worked oh, out. It worked out, but um, it did. Okay. Yeah, and, and it isn't, I got Melissa Richardson. She um, she didn't show any interest until my third manuscript. So I had I shared two prior, and then on the third time, she was then she was like, "Okay, what else do you got, kid? You got my attention." You know, so sometimes it's that mm-hmm. it's that third one that really works. Okay, well, what advice would you give if you were like a kid again? Oh, what would uh, you give advice uh, for a, a little kid? Yeah, definitely uh, buy some Bitcoin as soon as it comes what? out. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about cryptocurrency. Um, no, <laughs> not, not, um, no, but I think I would just say like, hey, enjoy being a kid and and play. And, um, I think that the mindset of a kid is helpful to have for writers that write picture books, thinking like a kid. Um, and so just spend time in that, in that world as long as you can and, and never grow up because being adult is the worst. <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. You yeah. have a great family now. Oh, yes, I do. Yes. And that. What else do you like to do besides teach and write? Oh, man. Um, my family takes up most of my time, which is the best part of my life. Uh, my two boys and my wife, Catherine. Um, there's not a lot of time for other things besides teaching and family life. Just in this season right now, we have two boys under three. Our oldest, Peter, will be three in December. Mm. Um, and little Albie, um, he's just newly six months old so it's like you teach all day and then you just (laughs) want to be done but you're on you're on even more as a parent um and so it's just an exhausting season of life so I write in the in-between times a lot of my first drafts or ideas are coming uh late at night and I'll find myself Mm -hmm. I can't sleep and so I'll get out my iPhone and and put some words down and Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of life's intense right now. It is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, where can we learn more about you and, and where to buy your book? Um, yeah. So if you go to, uh, I have a website I run 
It's a literary blog where I feature picture books and agent interviews, um, interviews with authors and illustrators. Um, it's pbspotlight.com, picturebookspotlight.com. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of my main blog, and you can find out how to buy the Book of Rules there. It's sold uh, anywhere books are sold, Amazon. Um, I have a link on that on that book on the books page on my website for um, the Learning Tree, which is a Kansas City local indie bookstore here. That's my local yes. partner, and folks can get a signed copy if they purchase through the Learning Tree. So perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing with us today. Thanks for having me, Kathy. It's nice You're to welcome. see you. And write yeah. some more, well, when you can. I yeah, like... absolutely. <laughs> more 1 a.m. books on my iPhone, please. <laughs> yes. More All right. Um, thank you so much. We'll see you later. Thanks, Kathy. Mm -hmm.